policies that help foster growth, i.e. wise use of public money in supporting infrastructure development, health, education, in enabling the empowerment of citizens, in, in, in fostering the environment for the creation of businesses, allow these economies to catch up. If you think, if you think about it, the, the, the last few decades, yes, we've seen uh, China, Korea, Taiwan, Asia in particular, now a little bit uh, Latin America starting to catch up with strong growth rates. But beforehand, these were regions which stagnated or regressed in part because of political, political upheavals. Many of these countries were, were colonized and therefore in, in the 19th century and therefore led to a, a path of development that was not necessarily optimal for, for medium to long term growth. Then you had uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the Cold War, uh, the communist experiment. Yeah. These were not the optimal policies, but these are large economies with large and growing population that are growing actually faster than in many cases than the developed world, and with a GDP per capita which is still way behind what the West is. So yeah. if they can have access to the right technologies, if they can educate themselves, there's no reason why they shouldn't catch up, and that should lift your overall uh, GDP growth. I mean, in the case of China and India, I don't think we're talking catch up anymore because we relatively or generally expect these economies to eclipse the US uh, GDP within the next 20 or so years. No, but no, what I would, will be, what will be generators of growth, though? I would first correct you, Alirato. Yeah. We're still talking about a lot of catch up when it comes to China and India because yeah. even though thanks to the huge size of the population, the yeah. economies might overtake the US in the next few decades. In terms of GDP per capita, in terms of the income per person, they're still way behind. Yeah. So the catch up there might take another 100 years, you know, maybe 100, 150 years, who knows. Yeah. But they, they can continue growing for, for a long time. Obviously, other countries which may be lagging a little bit, you might think of Indonesia, Vietnam, we mentioned Nigeria earlier on, these are countries of great potential, endowment of resources, growing population, a greater entrepreneurial spirit, uh, education that is finally coming to the fore. If the right policies are adopted, these are countries which can play a bigger part. Will the growth be smoothed? I mean, you've just referred to the fact that, yes, technically, China and India are growing really high, but in terms of the trickle down to the ordinary person, we've still got some gaps there. And this presents the disconnect generally that we're mm. seeing in emerging markets. Is this growth going to be smooth? Do we still have risks of a double dip? Is it V-shaped trajectories from sharp declines to sharp increases? Oh, absolutely, you know. I mean, we 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 do we do we won't have a smooth path because there will be accidents alongside the road, which most of us cannot predict. You know, how many analysts six months ago were predicting what is happening in North Africa and the yeah. Middle East right now? Not many, if 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 any at all. So obviously, you will we'll have time when the growth is distributed unequally, mm -hmm. where there's resentment along some parts of the perception where some parts of the popu uh, population, sorry, some parts of the population do not want that growth model, they rather hark back to some uh, more uh, sheltered, uh, more secure, even though poor uh, uh, past, uh, golden age in history, and y you will have conflicts, you, you will have difficulties. But at the end of the day, you know, more and more countries, and that is what uh, Willem Bauter, our chief economist, was pointing out in that report, are reaching a level of institutional depth and quality of, uh, of social partners which can basically um, act as a counterpart to more radical tendencies, which means that even though you will have accidents, the ability to recover from these accidents yeah. will be better than were in the case. One of the ways to mitigate against those unforeseen accidents on the road is to have policies that allow uh, states to absorb those who fall by the wayside. And there's a lot of talk within the OECD about cash deposits and creating savings schemes that we're seeing work really well in Latin America, but uh, we're seeing a bit problematic in Africa. What, what would help Africa prepare for those you mean, you unforeseen? Mean, you mean private, private savings schemes or government? In Even the, government initiated savings yeah, schemes. Yes, and, and that is a debate that is take, has taken place in mm -hmm. South Africa, actually, because we, we have been told that we're soon going to have like uh, necessary uh, saving scheme. But that, that, is, that is clearly a, uh, an, an important issue because historically, you know, in uh, less developed countries, in particular in African countries, where also the health expect the life expectancy was low, people either don't expect to live long. You know, mm -hmm. so people don't don't want to plan for the future because what is the future going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, you got to, you got to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So they 
the horizon is not long enough for people to start saving and sparing for when they might be sick or when they might be old. Mm -hmm. Also, you still have the reliance on the old family structure, you know, a large family that my children will help me. Eventually, as that change, you know, as children move on to the city, get a job, become more independent, do not want to live with a, a large family together, then the other members of the family might think, well, I mean, I need to, I need to put a bit of money aside. It's starting to happen, in particular, more and more people are putting money aside for their children's education.